As a watercolor instructor, when we're working with newcomers to the medium, it's great to let them play around with the exciting aspects of uh, color and brushwork and how the water interacts. But at some point along the, the scale, if we don't uh, address the issue and introduce the ideas of design, uh, we're doing our students a disservice because one of the goals as an instructor is to help your students develop stronger and stronger paintings. We look at the tried and true Whitney's tools and rules of design that are outlined so well in his uh, 1970s book, Complete Guide to Watercolor Painting, and still hold very true today. And anyone that's taken a, a workshop with me knows that I'm an absolute zealot about Ed Whitney's teachings and uh, philosophy of making art in general. This book is still available uh, at Cheap Joe's and I recommend it highly. Uh, one of the things that uh, we deal with when we bring students into this whole idea of tools and rules of value and design is uh, I call it the glazing over effect that it uh, can seem very tedious and it tends to overwhelm uh, students with too much information sometimes. So we try, we try to break it apart and look at a couple of these design principles at a time. The most important to the beginning stages of watercolor that we understand are color and value. Color relationships, creating color harmonies that work with the painting, and then value that we create within the shapes of our paintings. Value being the light and dark that have to work together to create a visual uh, design. When we look at a painting like this, again, we quickly identify lights, dark areas, and then middle value. I don't think that people in general have difficulty understanding the concept of value, but when we try to create the value on our, our paper and within our painting, that's when we seem to run into problems because it is tricky. Why is that so? One of the things we have to do to, to identify how the values are working within our painting is to actually see through the color and identify the shapes of value in terms of lightness and darkness. There are some great tools for allowing us to do this. Uh, one of the physical things that we do to see value better is, as I mentioned earlier, to squint. To put our eyes almost completely shut to just where we barely see through that opening and we can identify much easier the areas of light and dark in our painting and the relationships between those areas. Why does that work? Because squinting reduces the chroma and you can test that yourself by squinting and opening your eyes and seeing all of a sudden you see color, now you don't. You see color, now you don't. We try to define values within a painting again based on a scale and there are a lot of different types of value scales. Uh, many of them, like the one I have on the back of my card here, a horizontal scale going from 1 to 10 or 11. Most of the scales go from uh, 1 being complete white to 10 or 11 being very dark or completely black or very close to black in uh, number 11. Don Rankin's Value Finder is a great product not only in the field but for the studio so that you can check out uh, how you're doing with the value that you're creating in your painting. Uh, and what we do again is we hold down the value scale over a spot of our painting and we squint. And if the value shows through lighter in the small circle opening, we know that we need the value to be darker if we want to say recreate an 80% or number 9 value in our painting. I'm going to show you a little activity that I've developed that seems to help uh, my students understand value and apply it to their paintings in sort of an easy fashion. Uh, value can be one of the things that students struggle with. I know that uh, for my first two years of painting watercolor, there was a lot about value that I just didn't get. Luckily, Joe Miller came along and set me on the right path and helped me to understand the, the concept better and to actually reproduce what I needed to do with value in my paintings. Let's take a look at this little activity. When we talk about the design concept of value in a watercolor painting, uh, first let's address how we create value. And we, we create value in one of three ways. We dilute, and I can do this with any color. 
So when I talk about a value range of a color, we know that all pigments can exist as light value colors because, or light value pigments because we can dilute them down to almost nothing with water. When this dries, this won't be completely white by any means. It'll have a tint of blue, but it's going to be a very uh, high value uh, pigment or high value color wash. The other way that we create value is to condense. And that means to reduce the water in the mixture and to intensify the pigment. And we can do this to get the, the color, the pigment, as deep in value as possible. Deep and dark being interchangeable terms. Now again, if we, we certainly squint, we can see the extreme differences between those two swatches. The other way we can create value is to combine. If I take some burnt sienna and I take a little bit of this ultramarine violet, combine these two colors in a swatch, we can see that when that dries that's going to have its own unique value when we look at the value range. It's important that we understand that, but even more important is that we understand the fact that every pigment we use has an inherent value range, meaning that, of course, we can go extremely light with that pig pigment by diluting, but at some point, the darkness or the depth of that pigment bottoms out. We look at a lot of value scales, and again, we've got several here. Many of them are horizontal, going from 1 to 10 or 10 to 1 uh, in terms of lightness and darkness. Don Rankin's value scale is a very useful tool that uh, is sort of done in the form of a, a right angle with the lighter colors starting with 1 and going up to number 6. Notice that I've numbered these, again, because that corresponds to uh, Whitney's suggestion to create numbered value patterns when you do a, a value sketch. Uh, so I've numbered them 1 to 6 and then from 7 to 11 which again is black. One of the activities I suggest you do, uh, and I call it my once in a lifetime value activity, uh, because when students look at this uh, they go, how long is this going to take? Three weeks? Uh, no it's not. But it's the kind of thing that I can assure you, if you spend the time creating this value activity, you're going to have a much deeper understanding of how value works in your pigments and in the watercolor painting. Let's talk about what I do here. I take a, uh, a bottle of Sumi ink and uh, actually have that on a small porcelain palette. And I try to replicate to the degree possible uh, this value pattern or this value scale on Don Rankin's from 1 to 11. The other thing that I found that's a, I guess, somewhat unique way of presenting this information is I turn my value scale from horizontal to vertical. And I think about it in terms of the analogy to a pond. Again, with the top of the pond being light and the light at the bottom of the pond being almost non-existent. So we could actually think about this in terms of an 11 foot deep pond going down with 11 being the very bottom dark black of the pond, one being white light hitting the top of the pond. The reason I like this is it's an analogy that students seem to be able to remember. When you look at a lot of the value scales they seem more technical and more numerical and they just don't seem to stick in terms of the concepts. So again, what I want to ask you to do is take your Sumi ink and try to replicate each value. Course number one is quite easy. We just do a, as light a tint using the ink as possible. It's not going to be completely white. And again, how do we check to see that we have replicated this value scale? Notice there's a small hole in the center of each of the values and we hold it over whatever value we're trying to achieve and again we squint with our eyes very narrowly closed. If you notice lightness in the hole then you know you need to go a step or two darker with your value and again if the hole is uh, 
appears darker than the surrounding uh, value scale, you can actually go in and scrub a little bit and lift off to match that. Now this sounds tedious and I'm not going to tell you it's not, but it's also rather meditative. Uh, it's actually a process I enjoy. Uh, not all the time, but the first couple times you do it, I think you'll find out that it is something that's uh, a bit relaxing and it sort of ingrains the different value scales into your, your mind. One of the things we encounter when we get down into the middle values is they become very difficult to visually differentiate. It's sometimes quite hard to tell the difference between a 5 or a 6 or a 7 or an 8. So we have to work exceptionally hard to try to match those and you're not going to get them perfect but you're going to get them pretty much in the same ballpark. The next phase is that I can take any of my pigments and I can do exactly what I did with the Sumi ink, which is, by the way, a charred bamboo product. You could use any type of ink, uh, an indigo ink, or you can also use uh, a pigment like Prussian blue to create the same value scale. I think it does help to have it on a grayscale uh, format. But again, we can now take any pigment such as Aurelian, and we can try to match that pigment with the uh, Sumi ink value scale that we've painted. And again, it's going to take a little trial and error and we're going to try to get close. We check it to see if number two is an, actually a number two, and it is. And then we find that Aurelian will go no deeper in value than a number two. And again, I go ahead and paint each swatch in a one inch square. Uh, I use a Cheap Joe's angled shader brush for this. It's actually about a one and a half inch uh, grid that I made on a piece of watercolor paper. Uh, I use Cheap Joe's angle shader to come in and again try to get my lightest value. This is ultramarine violet that I would start with over here. For the first value I may Damp it down just a bit. Try to come in with my number two value. Angle shader makes a great tool to do these nice little uniform squares. I can already see that's a little too dark for a value two. So I damp it down, match it out, and that's pretty close. So I work myself, I work my way all the way down. And as, as I said, at some point I may notice, for example, this Rose Matter American Journey bottoms out in a number six. When I squint and match the dot, it's perfect with a six. But when I go to a number seven, oh, that dot shines through, clear as a bell. So I know that Rose Matter is unable in its normal state, and that's an old term from the 30s and 40s, normal state meaning the intense the most intense uh, swatch you can get without becoming opaque. So I know that rose matter is going to go no deeper in the pond than a number six, and I can mark that as such. I guarantee that you will remember your pigment values much more effectively if you do this. Now, when you add a new pigment to your palette, you can come over and leave a bunch of extra grids or start another whole paper full of grids and paint that value scale down for that particular pigment. You only have to do it one time, once in a lifetime, as long as you use that pigment and you're able to gauge how that pigment is going to uh, uh, fare in the, in the pond. How deep is it going to go? How dark can it be? Now the other thing that you'll notice when you do this, if you continue to paint the dark swatches, you'll notice any unfavorable characteristics that the pigment exhibits after a certain point. For example, I noticed that yellow ochre, long about stage number seven, starts to do what we call bronze, that it develops sort of a sheen. There are several other colors that are prone to doing this as well. Uh, Prussian blue will bronze. So again, at some point, even though the color may go darker, uh, it will develop some characteristics that you don't want showing up in your painting if you use it in full strength. Uh, and that, that's a good thing that you can learn from this as well. Lastly, you can learn how to combine pigments and gauge. So if I take a uh, phthalo blue, which goes almost all the way to 11 in the value scale, 
and I combine it with a glaze of raw sienna, which is a five, a middle value color, then I know that I'm likely to get somewhere in between those two, depending on the concentration that I choose for each of those amounts of color. So I think this can be a, a very helpful activity to try and keep in your studio, carry with you in your portfolio when you go to workshops, uh, because it gives you a quick reference to understand the value that's inherent in each of your pigments.